We have two scripture lessons for today. Our first one is going to be from Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verses 4 through 9. So go ahead and put a thumb on Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. And then we are also going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. So take a moment, go ahead and grab a, a bookmark or a sheet of paper, uh, mark off those two scriptures, pause the video to do that so that you have, give yourself a little time, grab a cup of coffee, grab whatever you need, and then let's read God's Word together. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9 reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Our second scripture from 2 Timothy, second scripture from 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Paul writes to Timothy saying, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is God's word to us today. Let's pray. Lord, help us to know and to love your word. Remind us of the goodness that is in it and compel our hearts towards you. That we would engage your scripture not as cold rote duty, but as an act of love and devotion to you. Lord, during this time, strengthen my words, for mine are empty. But as we talk about this scripture, your words, O God, are the very words of eternal life. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your understanding of the New Testament? Think about that for a minute. Give yourself a score. If you have to, pause and really kind of assess where you are on that. And then, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your understanding, your knowledge of the Old Testament? I'm going to guess, uh, and I'd like you to think through that carefully as well, but I am going to guess that you, you said, well, okay, maybe I, I could be better on the New Testament, but my guess is that for the vast majority of us, you heard 1 to 10 Old Testament, you go, oi, are there negative numbers? Knowledge of Scripture is a funny thing. Because it's something that we know we ought to have, and yet at the same time, it is also something that, that too many of us, I would dare say, try to, to push off to the side or try to avoid with any number of reasons. The problem with this being is that, the, that mature disciples seek to know God's Word. We are continuing in our Defining Discipleship series, and we have gone through the qualities of the heart. We talked about those before Lent, and now we are here at qualities of the mind. And we have to deal with knowledge of Scripture and some, some other areas that um, maybe make us not enthusiastic. You know, for Christians of the head, head Christians, this is an exciting topic. Ooh, I can talk about theology, and I can talk about the finer points uh, of Wesley, and, and of uh, Calvin, and of Zwingli, and of Augustine, and, 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 and for too many Christians, 
we hear that and we go, oh, please, is there a football game on? Is ice skating on? Um, can I take a walk in the park? But we have to, to grapple with the reality that mature disciples seek to know God's Word. Back in 2004, December of 2004, and I, I, as I was thinking about this example, I'll have to admit that I was thinking, ooh, I'm going to do something, current events, and then I realized how long ago this event happened. But back in December of 2004, Donald, the uh, then Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, came under fire both from the media and from members of the armed forces for not providing armor plating for Humvees in the war in Iraq. And the question that we need to ask is, why is it that Donald Rumsfeld came under attack for that? Well, the quick and easy answer is because he's the Secretary of Defense. That's his job. Part of his portfolio is to make sure that the U.S. armed forces had what they needed to go into battle and to engage the mission that they were given. He made a comment that didn't sit well with many people. He said, you go to war with the army you have, not with the army that you want. And for too many, that, that didn't sit well enough. There was a practical side to it, but there's also the choice side of it. Was it a wise choice then to send those troops into battle without armor plating into an area where they knew there were landmines? That was the debate. Did the Secretary of Defense send our troops in well enough equipped? Because we believe that our military, our soldiers, should have the equipment that they need. It, it's kind of a duh belief, but if you're going to have a military, you have to equip them. You have to give the soldiers the, the, the equipment that they need to succeed in their mission. Otherwise, they are going to be killed. They're going to be killed in the most routine and preventable of ways in a war. And to connect to the idea that mature disciples seek to know God's Word, the same is true for knowing God's Word in the Christian life. To be a follower of Christ, to, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, we are to know God's Word. Paul explains this to Timothy in his final charge to Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, he actually talks in the first part about his way of life. But when it comes down to it, Paul wants Timothy to measure everything he does and to be anchored by God's word. He says but in verse 14, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from instant infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And that's where we pick up with today's scripture. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that, and here is the important part of it, and this is where all of us have to pause and say, oh, oh, I see. So that the servant of God, you and I, followers of Jesus Christ, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, there are uh, multiple ways of not being prepared. There are multiple ways uh, of not being prepared uh, to, to do God's work. You know, we can say, you know, I, I, I'm not really a, 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 an academic type person. I'm not really a scholarly type person. 
but you know what, I can fix things, so I'm going to go and I'm going to, to just go and fix things for people, and that's my service to God. But the problem with that is, or perhaps I'm, I'm the emotional one, I'm the one that people can come to for comfort, and I can make them feel good. And that is my service to God, and that's what I am good at. The problem with that is that God does not make us single-dimensional people. And he does not have a single-dimensional work. And we are not in a religious factory where it's like, okay, you provide your one thing, and I provide my one thing, and you go down the line, and then people will come out a complete Christian. It doesn't work that way. Because the person who is offering comfort also has the opportunity to talk about hope and to talk about the hope that they have in Jesus Christ and why they're able to offer comfort. The the person who fixes things and goes in and maybe isn't scholarly, academic, can go in and and connect with people and and do for them and say, you know what, I want to be like that person. Why, Why do you do things like this? And are able to say how they are responding to God's grace in their lives. To know that they have been forgiven, that, that everything that they have done wrong has already been accounted for, and God says, yes, I still love you. Because it isn't just the things that we do and we say, oh, see, I gave my thing. What a good job I did. But God has more, and God wants us to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here's the thing. Um, If we rely on pastors and certain people in the congregation too much, then the kingdom of God has lost its outposts. It has lost each person who offers a gift somewhere, particularly in our community. Whether it is uh, in their own home, or whether it's in Friendship Manor, or whether it's in the workplace, or it's in Hy-Vee, or whether it is across the river, Doing, going to wherever they might be going and walking in Sunderbrook or going and shopping and picking some up, something up at Home Depot or at Costco or at Sam's Club or at Walton, whatever it is. God wants us to be equipped for every good work, not the good works that we define, but the ones that he is trying to prepare us to see as we go about our lives. Are we prepared for every good work that God wants us to accomplish? That's something that we have to consider. Are we ready for what God wants us to accomplish on his mission? Just like a soldier who does not have the proper equipment, uh, who not having the proper equipment cannot complete his or her mission, we cannot complete our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ and to bring people into relationship with God and to know the redeeming love of God. We cannot accomplish that if we are not thoroughly equipped for every good work. God's Word equips believers for service. Here's the thing, though, as well. It's not just kind of an equipping and, all right, I'm going to get suited up and go out there as well. There is actually a heart aspect to this because throughout time, and we see this in the Deuteronomy text as well, God desires for his people to know him and to love him and to be in communion with him. Since the earliest accounts of human history in Genesis, God has shown to us that he wants to be known. He is not sitting up in a throne room, high and mighty, and and the doors are closed, and you have to make an appointment, and and it's hard getting through God's secretary, and and then you have to fill out a, a form. No, God has shown from the very beginning that he wants to be in communion. He wants to be in relationship with us. 
We used to walk with God in the garden in the cool of the day. And I wonder what those conversations look like. You think about what it must have been to be Adam and Eve to walk with God in the cool of the day after tending the garden and, and cultivating the, 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 the untainted soil and the perfect land. Hmm. And God said, rest. Come on, let's go walk. It's time. You've done enough for the day. God has wanted to know us, and he has wanted to be known by us. We are to be in relationship with him. But we cannot be in relationship with God if we do not know who God is. We cannot be in relationship with with God if all we know is kind of an idea of God. When Katie and I became engaged, we knew each other. We didn't have an idea of what the other person was and said, yeah, I'm okay with that. We knew one another and we continue to know one another and to, to understand each other and to learn about each other. Not ideas of each other, but the actual person. That's how we have a relationship. You can't have a relationship with an idea, but you can be in relationship with another being that you know and who knows you. And what happens is that knowing God anchors us in a broken world. Because here's the deal. When we go out into the world and, and we do not know God ourselves, and we haven't read his word and we haven't seen how he reveals himself and, and seen how Jesus reveals him in the Gospels and see how he reveals himself in the Old Testament and through the prophets and through the priests and through the kings and through the people and in, in visions and in in all the ways and through the apostles and through the early church, then we go out there and our idea of God can get blown this way and that. Ideas can get tossed around. Ideas can get batted around. But when you know a person, your knowledge is pretty concrete. And knowing God anchors us in that. That's why God says, listen, all my commandments, I want you to write them in your hearts. I want them to bind them to your, to your hands and, and, and bind them around your forehead and put them on your doorposts if you have to. Wherever you go, put, talk about my commands when you, when you get up and when you sit down and when you're with your kids and when you're with your spouse. Wherever you are is a great place to be talking about who I am and to be encouraging and strengthening one another in that knowledge. Because I am constant. God is the same yesterday and today and forever, as we learn in Scripture. And we see that as we look at the, at the great narrative between Deuteronomy and, and Paul and Timothy, and see how God's Word is, points to His constancy. And so we are able to know him because he is constant and we can be anchored in our world when everything, everything seems to be shifting. Has your world shifted in the past year? Here's the thing, God has not. Do we recognize that? Our understanding of God can grow and expand and can be applied to our lives in new and different ways, but who God is does not change. And we can read that and see it and know him as he wants to be known. So, what are we going to do? 
That's the question. What are we going to do? Because let me just say what's true here. We can make excuses either to know God or not to know God. We, we can make excuses to find ways to engage God and to, to know Him more and to, to help others to know Him, or we can make excuses not to do that. How do you do with knowing His Word? Do you think about reading Scripture and say, you know what, I'm not an academic, I'm not a scholar, this isn't for me. Um, you know, there's just too much in there that I don't understand that's too far of a culture removed from us. I don't understand some of the phrases. I can't, there's, it, this would take me too much time and I really don't have the time. Or do we look and we say, you know, there are some things, but I also know that I have... Um, some resources in my Bible. And you know, if those don't work, I've got some friends who are reading the, the, through parts of Scripture, and I can go to them, and I can find help from them. And you know what? We have a pastor, and I think, I think he likes to talk about Scripture a little bit, and probably likes to help people understand Scripture. I bet he would be willing to talk with me about it. Boy, this is going to be make time, but boy, is God worth it. I can't think of a more solid investment in my time than to know God. Seeking new things can be addicting. That's why things like Facebook and, and Twitter and, and uh, any form of social media can be so addicting because we want to see the next thing. We want to see the next article, the next image, the next phrase, the next 140 character tweet that is going to trigger the, the, the receptors in our brain and release dopamine and, and give us that high for a couple of seconds more. Seeking new things, even new knowledge, can be addicting. Sticking with Scripture and, and fighting through language that we don't necessarily understand and cultural customs that we don't necessarily understand and, and ideas that are difficult and stories that rip our heart. That takes work. takes effort, and we know we'll never get there fully, and that's much, much harder. So what are we going to do? How are we going to go about committing to His Word? You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to know Greek, you don't have to know Hebrew, you don't have to know Aramaic or German or French or, or, or any of the scholarly languages in which articles are written and so on and so forth. But let me suggest that you do have to be committed to saying, I need to know more about Scripture in three months than I know today. And if in three months I do not have even a slightly better understanding of Scripture than I did three months ago, I've got to ask what I'm doing with my time. Here's the thing. Jesus' disciples walked with him three years. You know what he said? He said, I know you're not going to get this now. I'm telling it so that one day you understand. And what happened? He was crucified on a, on a cross just as he said he would be, and, and his disciples scattered just as he said they would. They didn't get it. But then they came back after Jesus was resurrected and they saw him and they started to understand. Three years of teaching and preaching and it took death and resurrection to make something click. You would have thought fishes and loaves would have done something there. Hello. But it didn't. It took time. It took effort. But to their credit, they were doggedly committed to being with Jesus and to hearing Him, and to knowing Him. 
Are you committed to knowing more three months from now than you know now? Or do you want to commit to something different? Do you want to commit to a one-year reading plan? I can provide you with one of those. Or perhaps a discipleship group. Perhaps you say, I can't do this on my own, but you know what? I've got two others. Would you disciple us in the Word? Yes. Yes, I would. Let's get together. Maturing disciples seek to know God's Word so that we are equipped and so that we know God in a deeply personal level. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for showing us who you are. Whatever our fears, whatever our hindrances, whatever our obstacles are to knowing you and to to engaging your word, help us to overcome them. And help us to know the joy of knowing you, our Lord and our Savior. Strengthen us as we go about this. Drive it deep in our hearts and help us to live by faith. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.